Welcome to the Hyperledger uh, fifth anniversary series of panel conversations about the past, the present, and the future of enterprise blockchain technology and the Hyperledger product and community and all that. Um, we're really happy to be joined by an amazing panel. But before we get started with that, first, uh, uh, if all of you could throw into the chat where you're calling from, which city, uh, which region, whatever you're comfortable with sharing. Uh, the strength of Hyperledger has always come from its global community and its really diverse community uh, in terms of backgrounds and companies and organizations and the like. So we'd love to get a taste of that here amongst all of you and and, uh, and really help us understand uh, uh, who we're talking with. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is the last panel of our five week panel series reflecting on the five years of Hyperledger. We've covered uh, our early history, kind of where, where the project started and where we came from, the role for Hyperledger in transforming trade and trade finance, especially with a focus on the Asia Pacific region, how we're playing a disruptive role in fields like energy and healthcare, and how we're impacting the future of money. All of these are available uh, on the Hyperledger website as links. You can go back and watch the panels and, and uh, I, hopefully that, that is an interesting way to start a, a morning for some of you. Um, uh, we also have coming up on Thursday, a uh, social happy hour meet and greet uh, with the rest of the Hyperledger community. It's a very casual, relaxed thing. Feel free to join. Um, you'll find a link to that on the Hyperledger website. We're also doing one on Friday morning in the Asia Pacific Pacific region uh, as well, just so that timing works for everybody to be able to, to connect and get to know each other. We also still have fifth anniversary t-shirts available, which I'm modeling here a little bit. Uh, uh, there's better pictures of this online um, and it is green and it matches my background, which is why you can see through my chest. Don't worry, it's by design. Um, those are available. They are free shirts, that, but you have to pay for shipping. Sorry about that. Um, but the code to access that is hype five year. And we'll put that link in the chat um, just so that you can see H-Y-P-E-5-Y-E-A-R, um, if I have it right. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, now we're gonna have a panel on looking ahead to the next five years and beyond. What kind of impact lies ahead? What kind of challenges? Uh, this is, you know, 2020 is a pivot point year in so many ways for so many of us. And I think particularly in the blockchain community, the enterprise side in particular, um, this has been quite a year. Uh, and to lead this panel, we've asked Michael Casey, uh, who's a, an esteemed journalist. He's the chief content officer for Coindesk and co-host of the Money Reimagined podcast to lead the conversation. So Michael, take it away. Great, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, I'm gonna take this as, a, as an idea next time we do a panel, like a call out to everybody to see where you're coming from because it's great to see such a variety of, of locations. And I'm impressed by, I think it's probably the Indi the folks in India, like uh, Sushi, Zindal and Punjab there, probably out the latest, I would imagine, because I did see some, nobody from my home country of Australia, but very pleased to see that uh, Mr. Baldin, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from Hamilton in New Zealand is dialing in, which is 7 a.m. there, so up early, but uh, it's great. Really fabulous to see such a wide array of folks. So, so good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening. Uh, whatever time it is, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, some, some familiar faces and some new ones to me, worked with a bunch of these people over the years. And I tell you, this is gonna be a, a really interesting discussion. Um, first of all, let me introduce the panel. Uh, you, you, you think you all know Brian, so he really doesn't need any introduction, but he's gonna wave again. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Sandra Rowe, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Global uh, Business Blockchain uh, sorry, I, I, I'm a member of the GBPC. I should have got that right, Sandra. I'm sorry. Global Blockchain Business Council, Sandra Rowe. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we also have Alisa Worley, who is the Global Marketing Director for Blockchain and Multi-Party Systems at Accenture. And she's also a chair of the marketing committee for Hyperledger. And last but definitely not least, Emiliano Vanini, uh, who is head of ICT uh, innovation strategy at Poste Italiani. So thank you all of you for being here. Uh, I think this is gonna be a great discussion. Uh, I just thought I would just open up a little bit just to give a bit of context here. Let's frame this a bit in terms of where we are. This is a, this is a looking forward panel. So, you know, let's, let's just put a, a milestone in where we are in this particular moment. Uh, you know, this is a pivotal year. We don't need to uh, sort of weigh too heavily, I think, on how significant 2020 is as, uh, you know, something of a transformative moment for the global economy. Uh, clearly, you know, the big story being COVID. Uh, I think that's really relevant to stories or to, to this, the, the conversation around decentralization, because in many respects, 
it is a decentralization challenge. The pandemic is something that just refuses to abide by borders and structures and organizations. Uh, and I think it, in some of the challenges that as a society we've confronted really point to how do you organize uh, around something as, as global and international as this uh, with these you know, somewhat outdated hierarchical structures of organization that we have around that, whether it's talking about supply chains and the delivery of, of, of medical goods or just, just simply how uh, we share information, public information and private information uh, uh, with regards to medical records. We've got economic challenges as a result of that. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's debt problems looming. There's been a massive amount of money printing from central banks, which you know, is raising questions about the future of what money looks like. Um, the fourth industrial revolution, nonetheless, is powering ahead with 5G coming, uh, IoT, AI, you know, some incredible developments in this area. And this is all converging at the same time that we're seeing some real uh, developments within the blockchain space that are quite separate from what we've seen before. Uh, China, for example, launching its new digital currency, um, you know, th this, this new push towards central banks getting involved in this space um, and you know, integrating things like the blockchain services network there into the Belt and Road supply chain uh, out of that country. So governments, companies, and, uh, and decentralized communities all sort of coming together at a moment of real challenge for the global economy. So I think that's kind of the framework for this that I'd like to set. Uh, the other thing I think though is, you know, this is about, you know, a particular model of, of blockchain application. We're talking about sort of what we've tended to describe as the enterprise uh, blockchain applications. And, you know, uh, the, for the five or six years that this has been around, the five years that Hyperledger has been in place, I think we've really seen some sort of shifts in, 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 in this process where you know, consortia came along and some of them made real progress, some of them, some of them didn't. Um, you know, and some of that's revolved around like defining exactly what this is and what the opportunities are. Um, Elisa, I'd like to throw to you because you know, from your perch at Accenture, you get to see how different organizations and companies deal with this technology. And you've talked a bit about the mindset that needs to be brought to bear here in terms of the capacity to collaborate and work together across organizations. Um, it, it, how, where are we in that mindset? Are, are companies ready now to embrace this, this structure? So thank you for having me. And that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think it would, it would be, we'd be hard pressed if you've been involved in this technology on any level, if you're involved in technology at all, and you saw what happened this year with COVID unfolding, and it would be, you'd be hard pressed not to have seen what could be different if we had already, you know, made the giant leap into cloud, we were all fully digital, you know, organizations that were, had, had been regularly investing in, in their infrastructure and in innovation, did much better than those that were maybe a little bit slower off the off the start. So when we were looking at you know how innovation might be impacted by an event like this, you know we already look at the at the top ten percent of organizations that consistently invest and lead in investments in innovation versus the bottom twenty five percent, and you see that the return on investment for those the differential um, the, the 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 actual there, there's roughly you know two times. Uh, growth um, trajectory of the, the top 10% versus, versus the bottom 25%. And when you think then about how that was being transformed slightly in this current environment, we saw that the leaders in that top 10% were not only continuing to invest in innovation, but they were they were actually looking to partner. So David Tree, our business lead in blockchain, actually uses a, an African proverb pretty frequently that 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 goes, "If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together." And I would argue that in this environment, the only way to achieve both is is to collaborate. And I think that's what we're starting to see. We're seeing that the, there's a broad collaboration, both in, let's say, for example, with the, the, the work that we're doing with Banque de France, that brought together banks from both France and, the Switzerland, and Switzerland, as well as the central banks from France and Switzerland to come together and collaborate on how they could actually execute a true cross-border payment where money was actually moving from one country to another country. So I think it will be a really interesting time and certainly this plays to our sweet spot as we see more and more individuals and individual organizations coming together to collaborate because that is what will build out the resiliency. That will build out this, the data sharing model that we need to, to solve problems quickly um, and efficiently and effectively. 
Great, yeah. I mean, I, I've often sort of thought of it, one way to describe blockchain te technology is as a we technology, not a me technology. And that, and I think sometimes there's this corporate challenge because everything gets fed up through, you know, the the, the P and L and 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 the what's in it for me kind of question is a is one that can be answered around the collaborative the payoff of that collaborative benefits, but it takes. It takes some capacity to think outside of that silo mentality. So Sandra, maybe you could also weigh in because clearly the GBBC has been you know, talking to companies across multiple industries and you've been evangelizing for some time around this. What do you see? Is, is there a capacity emerging for companies to step outside the box and collaborate as Elisa was saying? So completely agree. And first of all, thank you uh, Hyperledger for, for having me here. and. Um, and I agree with everything that Elisa has said around enterprises um, that are collaborating are the ones that are advancing, um, particularly blockchain, because it is a team sport. We've heard this again and again. Um, but what I find really interesting here is look at the combinations of consortia that are coming together. A government entity with a central bank, with a enterprise you would have never thought would actually belong together. These misfit or seemingly misfit fitting institutions working together. I think this happens more and more. I mean, Emiliano, I'm sure will be speaking around um, his work at the post office, but whoever thought the post office would be innovating and yet they're a leading innovator. Um, I'd like actually Emiliano, if you would go talk to the US post office because they need to innovate too. Um, I think these cross collaborations are just gonna happen more and more. And let's face it between Hyperledger and the GBC and other organizations like us, who are bringing lots of folks together and, and putting them into a virtual room, not a literal one these days, but that's where the magic happens. And we're gonna see more of that, we have to. So Emiliano, why don't you pick up on this then? Because clearly, you know, with, with you know, you're, you're there at that sweet spot between public institutions and private institutions, um, you know, what, what sort of progress is being made there in terms of forming appropriate functioning consortia and private pu public partnerships? Maybe the European example is one that you can expand upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are trying. Uh, first of all, thank you for for having uh, invited me. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, with Alisa and with uh, and with Sandra. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it, despite it was a, a really strange year uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the last year for the blockchain, it was a really good year because there's a lot of stuff that uh, actually is, is going on. Uh, even in Italy, we are trying to put together the public sector, um, public agency with private companies uh, in order to build, uh, let me say, an Italian infrastructure uh, to, to speed up uh, blockchain blockchain adoption and the model we are working on is something that uh, uh, it's collaboration on the on the infrastructure and competition on uh, a higher layer on the services uh, on application so it's such a model that is called the competition so collaboration and competition together and i think that it is a really good model because uh, uh, as alisa said uh, uh, in this uh, in this scenario, in these markets, no one will compete alone. Everyone needs to collaborate, needs to uh, change mindset and shift from a silo approach to a, uh, a network approach. So, Brian, why don't you talk us through, you know, how, what, what, what Hyperledger and blockchain DLT technology in particular um, adds to all of this, right? So, you know, you, you're really interested in, uh, you know, you're working for some time in terms of open source systems, you know, open standards and, and, and open source software, uh, you know, and how does blockchain fit into all of that? And what is it, um, how does it fit into where trends are going, going forward for the next, uh, you know, the next five years? Sure. And um, actually, as a follow up to Sandra's comment, um, the US Postal Service did file a patent a few months ago uh, for the use of blockchain to help uh, secure voting by mail. Um, which is interesting. It was a little interesting wrinkle. I, was, wrinkle. I was worried it was like a portender of like something darker happening. But fortunately, I, I, you know that all that all happened smoothly. Um, but I, but no, I, I, you know, I jumped into this project I, a little bit less than five years ago. I started after it it, it started, um, <clears throat> partly because I saw 
blockchain technology as being the natural next step and progression of these kind of decentralizing forces that really started with the adoption of open standards. And uh, I mean, going back to the, the railway gauges and that sort of thing, uh, the size of screws, that sort of thing. But really, open standards is what built the internet to the, the, the next phase of that being open source software, which <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when it wasn't the presumed kind of way that we would collaborate around common technologies when it was seen as the outlier, the, the thing that those freaks, the, the hobbyists did, the, the communists, the people who didn't believe in making money from software, that sort of thing. I uh, remember when it was called a cancer on um, the software industry, right? Um, <clears throat> to now it becoming pretty established as the way that you do infrastructure level software and also a way that you explore whole new fields, right? Right, uh, kind of both at the, the end state of kind of a software life cycle maturity and also the beginning state of how do you map a, a landscape and figure out what's valuable there. Um, and uh, I think blockchain technology takes that the next to the, to the, in like the third step in that natural progression because it's a way of actually building open cooperative systems without needing to depend upon a central actor. In the same way, open source software does not depend and does not need a Red Hat at the center or need even a Linux foundation at the center. Um, open source software works because of the licenses and the code and, and the transparency in the development process. And likewise, uh, that's what, to me, made Blockchain Network such a re revelatory kind of thing. Um, and, and so that pivot point, I mean, open source software took years and years before it was even acquired the name open source software, before it became accepted, before a company like Microsoft would join the Linux Foundation. Uh, that was about a two decade window, right? Um, we are just, you know, five years in really, uh, arguably 10, if you count uh, Satoshi's paper as, a, as an inflection point, um, or longer if you talk about older consensus mechanisms, that Paxos, that sort of thing. But really in terms of industrializing this five years in, uh, and, and, and the pivot point from, you know, proofs of concept and trying this out and early success stories to what I think from this point forward would, uh, is going to be a normalization and acceptance into kind of the standard ways that the world works. I think that was kind of thrown for a loop in 2020. Um, I think the stuff that was in production at the beginning of this year did see growth, did see folks doubling down. I think there's a bit less capacity for experimentation and tolerance, but also a greater driver of the need to have to work together to solve problems that are bigger than any one of us can solve alone. So let's, do, let's get into that because I think it's an interesting, you know, it really did throw everything through a loop. So there's all this innovation being done and work being done and building out systems. And all of a sudden we had an entirely new problem to solve. Yet, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, this uh, trade-off between the, the need for public information um, and, and, and at the same time, the need for protecting the privacy around that seemed to me to come to bear. And what it did is also it highlighted, I think, uh, a, a richer conversation around the, the issue of, of identity and self-sovereign identity. So maybe Brian, back to you again, you can help us sort of stage this conversation a little bit because how do those things come in together and, and how is Hyperledger and, and other blockchain applications working into the self-sovereign identity solutions as it yeah. pertains to you know, some of these, these you know, health information challenges that we're facing? Well, pretty early on in Hyperledger's history, uh, you know, when we realized hey, we could be a home for fabric and be a home for other uh, uh, types of technology stacks that are appropriate in this space, that we um, were approached by a community that had been building a technology focused on digital identity. And that's what became the Hyperledger Indie project, which had since has grown to a family of projects, all focused on a radically different approach to digital identity online, uh, generally called self-sovereign identity. You could also think of it as user-centered identity. And Instead of logging with Facebook, logging with Twitter, and and having Facebook and Twitter being the sole authority of you know information about you and what's important, instead pivoting that to a, a more of a wallet-based approach, very much like a cryptocurrency wallet. You know, instead of holding tokens, you hold signed documents that attest to your driver's license, your passport, and maybe even now your test results uh, or your vaccination record, right? Uh, and so that approach to digital identity has grown inside Hyperledger, continued. We've seen deployments out there. We've seen you know. Fabric used, Indie used, um, obviously other blockchain communities have picked it up. And the role for a, a distributed ledger in that is to serve as that underlying kind of root of trust rather than hanging it all on a domain name registrar or hanging it all on um, a central TLS certificate issuer. Uh, instead, that is now those roots of trust can be shared amongst a wide community and you can choose uh, as an organization or an individual 
which routes, routes that you actually do trust. And this is the degree of flexibility and a degree of uh, 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 kind of distribution that the digital identity community has, has never had before. And that is now going to be extremely relevant when we talk about um, uh, the need for certificates and credentials where you really don't want a giant kind of database in the sky of who's healthy and who's not, uh, who's been certified or not, who's been vaccinated that has to operate globally. You wanna be able to federate that out to the countries, to the states, to regions, you know, to, and, and even to the individual to be in control of their health information, but still be able to use it to cross a border uh, or, you know, enter a movie theater or restaurant, perhaps if that's what, or enroll your kids in school uh, um, as historically we've, we've had to do, right? So, um, so that it's, it's, it's coming into play. There are lots of organizations now asking the right kinds of questions about how to build these kinds of technologies from the WHO uh, and um, uh, the international uh, ICC, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, all of these are folks are and IATA who run the airline, uh, kind of oversee the airline, uh, uh, global airline community. Um, all of them are asking the right questions. How do we do these kinds of credentials in a way that are privacy uh, preserving, privacy driven, um, I, but but also effective and trustworthy, uh, so that we can get back to to um, to a healthy globe, really. I mean, we just saw the the first vaccines now uh, in the United States just yesterday being administered. I think that that the UK were a few days ahead of it. I was so struck though, but when by when the UK did so, they were handing out these little cards uh, that you've been vaccinated, and and it just it just seemed like the easiest thing to forge in the world. That like we clearly at this time, folks, we need to be thinking of outside the box about something that is going to be uh you know that it, it, it is provable that it that is transportable and it has all these other features to it um but at least the the you know one one other key element of the COVID experience has been the challenges that supply chains have faced in the in the efficient delivery of you know ppe and 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 medical devices and clearly as the vaccines come that, that supply chain management piece is going to be really really important that that really was for some time, I think, one of the most dry, the most important driving use cases for an enterprise blockchain, these supply chain solutions. So, but as Brian said, there was kind of a bit of a disruption at the beginning of the year with this, by, by, by the entire economy being, being disrupted. So putting all that into light, where do you see, you know, supply chain management? I'm sure, sure that Accenture has sort of paid some, quite a lot of attention to that at this stage, having just gone through this disruptive year, are we, Further along the path of, of, of introducing and, and, and making you know, real uh, prime time use, uses of, of this uh, use case, or, or are we still some time to go? I, I actually think that th this is when the best innovation happens it is in times of crisis, right? So we have an absolute need for people across the globe and, and entities from you know, government uh, you know, NGOs, you know, people that have the infrastructure that we're going to need to leverage already in place. So Gavi, for example, with the, the initiative that they're doing with COVAX, we need to be able to take the systems that already exist and, and have already worked really successfully and be able to link them in a way that, that helps to accelerate what we need to do and need to do quickly. Clearly that there, there's an urgent need for us to, to solve this issue. The probably the, the, the biggest you know, human impact story um, any of us will see in our lifetimes. So I, I think that there's been a, mind, a natural mindset shift because we've seen some of the historic issues that we that have been prevalent for a long time, right? There's been a lot of frustration about how these the, the, the siloed elements of a of an end-to-end supply chain, and let's add the 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 you know the the trade finance element on top of it. There's there's been a, a lot of complexity baked in. Um, a lot of manual processes, um, a lot of paper, a lot of duplicative processes. I think I've heard something to the effect of, we did an analysis that said there was roughly 5,000 data points that we were collecting and that boiled down to roughly 100 data points. So the need to solve this problem and, and to do it urgently to solve this human impact problem is bringing together a lot of key players and certainly with Accenture sitting, um, bringing together their industry expertise or technical expertise, the relationship with all of these entities from the NGOs you know, to government systems. And then obviously our work with Hyperledger, the GBBC and others to, to solve this problem. So I think we're gonna start to see this shift to, to get a greater level of transparency and traceability um, to make sure that we are keeping counterfeit you know, drugs out of the, this particular supply chain. We, we won't be seeing supply chains built just for efficiency. We will be actually seeing supply chains built for resiliency. Um, and in the, same, in the same vein, 
the fact that these, these vaccines have been approved doesn't necessarily stop the data collection that's necessary for the individuals that need to keep learning, right? So we're, we're going to see, um, we're going to need to see how these, the longer term effects of, of, of you know, um, get, getting an, an, inoc an inoculation, actually, how, what does that mean for long term you know, immunity. What does that mean for somebody who has had, you know, maybe one but not both vaccines yet? Or how are different vaccines kind of, you know, playing up against each other um, and that impact? So being able to use the, the data that we're collecting as something moves across a supply chain and into somebody's arm, I think having that that mass of data in a usable format is going to be just incredibly you know, important for us to, to weather not only this pandemic, but certainly, you know, be prepared for whatever comes down the road going forward. That's, I think, what we're going to get out of this particular environment. We're going to see a, a resiliency mindset. And again, this mindset shift into what technology and information can do to help us weather this unbelievably unpredictable world that we live in. Uh, great, thanks, Elisa. Um, so, so, Sandra, from your again, from your perspective, with these different companies, so looking at supply chains just a, a little bit deeper, if we can, where do, which which industries, what sort of uh, use cases are you seeing at this stage? You know, the the most you know uh, ready made solutions coming to bear. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Michael. I think I want to take us to a more like specific. Um, problem that happened in the US in particular. And look, I think we can all agree whether you're sitting in the US or not, uh, the US was not a leading uh, example of, of how to do this right. Um, there were lots of things that went wrong. But I want to talk about the food supply chain, for example, in agriculture. And I think one of the things that we have to separate is the stuff that can be solved versus the stuff that cannot be solved, right? So what cannot be solved? What cannot be solved is if a meat packing uh, plant is shut down, then the meat's gonna back up, or sorry, the animals are gonna back up and you have an issue. However, where technology could help is helping policymakers, uh, executives at some of these companies make better decisions because they're seeing this information real time. And I think that is what blockchain can do and a blockchain system can do that just we failed at every level, whether it's food supply chain or PPE, you just see it. There was no visibility around real time access to information so that we could react in a crisis with data. And what Lisa you know, has emphasized, which is correct, we need better real time data, whether you are an executive at a major corporation or whether you are a government agency trying to make decisions properly. Without that, you're just flying blind. And let's face it, half of our government agencies were kind of acting, you know, like headless chickens. Um, they did their best, but they didn't. Uh, we didn't have the data points for them to actually arm themselves to be able to make decisions in a timely fashion. I think you know was a part of a big part of the issue. And let's face it, when I saw those potatoes being dumped by the potato farmers in Idaho, and then you saw right next to that queues of people lining up to um, for at food banks. I'm sorry, is this the US? We got to do better. Yeah, yeah, that brings it into to stark relief. That's right. Um, so, so Sandra, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, governments and, um, you know, kind of the, the, the regulatory framework as well being a factor here. And, uh, and Emiliano, I thought maybe you could you could pick up on this one because you know, one of the barriers to you know this this more collaborative structure that Elise and others have been talking about that, that to, for people to participate in these frameworks is that some of the regulations are outdated that there's you know corporate requirements uh, compliance requirements that, that that hold them back um, but at the same time there needs to be some level of, of framework that is one that crosses a across boundaries for one. Um, and that uh, essentially, I think, works as an incentive if it's a carrot or a stick, either way, for, for companies to actually work together in these things. So what, what's happening in Europe in particular, but where do you see you know, the regulatory framework developing for uh, enterprise blockchains? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, what I think that, uh, is that, uh, again, we have to start from what happened during the, the last year. So uh, the, the, the rapid growth of DeFi application, uh, the bull run of Bitcoin uh, uh, that reaches uh, the, the all-time heights, 
Uh, so, but, but also the, the transition of Ethereum from a proof of work to a proof of stake. So uh, I, I think that all these events are really important also because uh, they in some way capture, have captured the attention of regulators. Uh, and so uh, uh, regulators are really important to, to foster the, the, the evolution and the adoption of, uh, of uh, blockchain for enterprises and for public uh, administration also. It's such, let me say, such a, a bottom-up revolution, a bottom-up revolution and uh, uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, DeFi is something that uh, regulators cannot uh, ignore can no longer ignore. And so in the last year in, uh, in Europe happened uh, two or three very interesting things. Uh, the, the European Central Bank uh, released a paper about uh, uh, the, the digital euro. And so defining some way a strategy uh, to develop uh, a European uh, Central Bank digital currency. And in the paper, is clearly explained that uh, they do for one reason, because they don't want to lose control over money. Uh, there is also a, um, a proposal from the European Commission of Regulation for, uh, for digital assets, for crypto assets. It is called MICA. Uh, and uh, and also the, the the European Commission, the European Community uh, started a project that is named uh, uh, European Blockchain Partnership, uh, and is an effort of uh, over 25 countries uh, from uh, from Europe to build together uh, the governance, the regulation, but also an infrastructure, uh, a common European blockchain uh, infrastructure. Uh, I think that these are all very important things because, you know, um, even a, in a decentralized world, uh, it, it is important that uh, regulators uh, uh, could in some way define uh, the rules of the game. And, uh, and uh, it is very important also for, for enterprise to have the, the, a, a clear understanding or to what can be done and what can uh, cannot be done. Yeah, the, the governance question has been um, one that I think people are starting to pay a lot of attention to with regards to you know this this otherwise decentralized architecture and how it intersects with the with the real world. So you know you, you talked about law, but there's also you know this sort of other mid mid level area of, of just arbitration that can exist within these systems. Brian, I know you've got to be given a lot of thought to this because. You know, yeah, these systems have to work in the real world, and, and, and the internet offers something of, of a, of a, you know, an experience to draw upon. But it's a, still a very different world with this insertion of value of, of things like digital currencies into into blockchains. There's a, there's a, there's money involved, and it, and I think therefore yeah. the challenges around law and regulation and governance become bigger. Can you give your picture for where this governance uh, story is going? Yeah, well, I definitely want to distinguish between um, government, you know, the uh, the elected leaders in any country or or otherwise, uh, who you know, kind of define things that are unavoidable, and governance, which hopefully in most cases can happen amongst the organizations and individuals who participate on these kinds of networks, right? Um, and that kind of governance, I think blockchain technology gives us a lot of new tools that we didn't really have before to manage ourselves and manage ourselves in very voluntary ways. Um, I've used, for example, um, pre-blockchain, the kinds of self-regulatory structures that we're familiar with are things like ICANN, which manages the domain name system, which certainly benefited from having just enough government touch to, to kind of bless it by using it, uh, but was is actually supranational in that, you know, ICANN themselves, even if they started as a Department of Commerce, kind of project and spun out and has become kind of an international org separate from any any country and that's a really important thing to figure out what are the economics of how that works and how how do they actually 
you know, use a combination of carrots and sticks to accomplish this goal of a globally consistent domain name system, right? And as much as we can do uh, in, in kind of self-governance or, uh, you know, it used to be that industry self-regulation was, was kind of a joke as a term. Um, uh, but I believe if you, you know, set the rules up right of these blockchain networks and use smart contract code and, and chain code and others to kind of enforce those rules, you get this automated uh, compliance that, I mean, look, regulatory processes, whether government imposed or, or self-imposed are meaningless if there isn't consistency, right? If the presumption is that if you have enough money, you can get away with it, right? Uh, I, and, and the more that we can build these fair markets, uh, uh, provably fair markets through code, I think the better the outcomes come for participants in those markets. And the cool thing has been in the last few years, I think, to see regulators recognize that and view blockchain technology not as a threat, but as a form of reg tech that if they can participate with industry in the definition of those rules and say, here's the public interest that we're fighting for and need to defend, here's the existing regulatory infrastructure we'd like to try to, we're willing to reboot, we're willing to reevaluate, um, but the more we can automate that and get away from subjective processes to determine compliance and more to objective or even automated processes, the better off everybody is. So I'm incredibly enthused, whether it's in the um, central bank and money regulatory side or supply chains and food quality and any corruption efforts, this, this is the real opportunity for this technology, I think. So um, let's, let's let's jump to some of the questions. We've got about a few questions that have been coming in from, from our globally spread audience here. Um, I thought this one's a bit, bit of a news you can use type of question that uh, that I think is obviously in the minds of, uh, you know, any company looking to get into this. This comes from Mark Haddle, who says, you know, as blockchain enabled solutions mature, how are providers approaching efforts to commercialize it and how do you best price delivery of a blockchain solution? Fee for service, per user per month, subscription model. I mean, these these are just like you know rubber hits the road type questions, uh, Alisa. You know, can you give us give us the thoughts on best practices, advice on on this these kinds of things? I, I I don't know that I'm the best person to answer the question actually, um, because I think that that's a that's a pricing model and technology question. So I'm going to throw that over to Sandra and okay. think perhaps with your membership, you might actually have a better understanding of how that might actually work. Yeah. So, um, hi, Mark. How are you? I know Mark. Um, I, I have to say this is a very uh, important question. Here's the other problem. I've had enterprise blockchain, uh, sorry, I've had enterprises tell me not only is it hard for them to price blockchain services, but they don't know how to, uh, they don't have the metrics to measure the performance output because there's no standards around this kind of stuff right now. So you've got several levels of problems that we need to sort out. And I do think we're gonna get there with the help of Hyperledger and other organizations, but we do need a couple different things, which is what are the optimal levels versus public chains versus hybrid versus uh, private chains. And then on top of that, um, let's face it, like what are the metrics for deciding if a blockchain is performing well on certain you know, attributes or requirements than others. Um, we need to build all that out. I don't think we're there yet. Well, that's actually a really good one to key off, I think. And maybe I can go back to you here, Lisa, because you know, we're talking about how do you get to this mindset of collaboration? How do you build a sense that you know, this is, everybody's in together, there's benefit from that? Well, coming up with metrics and standards to define what the, what the both collective and individual payout is from this exercise would strike me as a pretty important part of that. Um, any thoughts on on how we 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 achieve along the lines of what Sandra was just talking about? I mean, like how do how do we make sure that the that the opportunity is profitable for for the well? How, how how do you define what that is, right? If it's if it's a collective payout where the, where the supply chain is more efficient and all of a sudden you know uh, potatoes are getting to where they need to go, um, you know, how, what does that mean for different players along the line? How do they actually sure. take measurement? apply it, I suppose, as, as a payout in some form, and therefore put a value on it for each participant in, in the uh, enterprise. You know, I think that, that that's, it's one of the things that I think is really exciting about this technology. And I'm gonna go into a, an area that um, that is one of my passion projects, which is how this technology creates almost like the great equalizer, right? So when you think about what we know about the technology today and what it can achieve, a lot of this is actually expanding upon what already exists and making it more uh, a shared success for all. So when you think about, what, like for example, with the vaccine distribution, 
one of the things that it exposed, and certainly that the pandemic in general exposed just this incredible inequality that exists not only in the US, but clearly across the globe. And one of the problems that needs to be solved is the last mile distribution of the vaccine, right? So how do we actually get this into communities in its current state? So you know, when you look at the Pfizer vaccine and it's you know the requirement that it maintains, a, it's, I think it's minus 81 degrees. Um, I've seen various statistics on this. You know, how do you actually get it to in, into the remote areas, um, maintaining that particular um, that particular temperature, and knowing that the lot size is is relatively large, et cetera. So you know, there's 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 a whole host of complications that that help us understand that there there's just not an equal playing field right now across the globe where everybody has the, the same access to the same infrastructure that allows them to participate at the same level that we take for granted. So what it's one of the things that I really do love about, about the, te uh, the technology that we work in because right out of the gate, even though I, I don't think we'll fully see what the potential for new opportunities are until this really starts to take hold, we know things like central bank digital currencies um, and tokenization will actually bring more people that are currently unbanked into the financial services infrastructure. We know that people, you know, that that may, for example, Sandra brought up the, the potatoes being ground into the ground when, when there were people that are food insecure, you know, or the fact that we had a run on toilet paper at, at the beginning of the pandemic, but we had an oversupply. So we had commercial toilet paper at, at, at a shortage, but we had, you know, we had institutional um, toilet paper that couldn't be redeployed because the supply chains couldn't interact. So I think we're seeing the, the, the exposure of the need for access to things like broadband, um, access to things like these these basic you know infrastructures, like I said, that we take for granted that will bring more people into you know the, the global economy. And it, we will we will challenge organizations then to to pay attention to the fact that if you are a tier three supplier versus a tier one supplier, that you that you all have a voice um, in, in creating a sustainable and equitable supply chain. So you're gonna start to see, I think, incredible opportunities unfold and a stabilization of just the socioeconomic you know, landscape across the globe because we will actually make a, an environment, a global environment that is a little bit more fair um, and that for companies translates to not only um, deploying you know, a, a corporate social responsibility that I think every big organization takes to heart, right? And is part of their plan, um, but we're bringing more people into the mix. Um, there's, there's a saying that, 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 you know, we kind of go by this ethos that, uh, you know, talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. So making sure that we are actually creating a dynamic that brings more people into the mix creates opportunity. I think that, that this technology will help to un unleash. And I'm really excited about seeing that, that actually come to, to the being, come to the fore. Yeah. So Brian, we're seeing a number of questions come in about private uh, versus public blockchains. And I know this is a topic that uh, is, I remember actually a, a debate you and Joey Ito had at MIT when I was there and uh, it was it was just fun to hear the way that this this thing played out. I know you've got sort of lots of opinions about how these things actually can interoperate. You know, how do you see the world now? I mean, this has actually been a year I think where we've seen the reemergence of public blockchains as as an opportunity, the, the emergence of DeFi and the advance of Ethereum in different capacities, and, and of course Bitcoin having a, yet another another a, a bull run. Um, do these things interoperate? Uh, do they work together? Is is it out of? Do we even? Is it even worth? making the distinction anymore between permissionless and permissions and so forth. What does the yeah. world look like of these different environments? Well, when we started five years ago, um, there were inklings that, that you know, the, the, this permissioned model of saying, hey, who runs the nodes actually matters and having them badge in in some way to participate in consensus uh, is perhaps a different approach than proof of work or, or, or proof of stake. Um, uh, that was a novel thing. Uh, it was, even though it was building upon, you know, in some ways, 20 years of Paxos and other distributed systems thinking, um, I needed a, a substantial modernization. Again, partly thanks to, to, to Satoshi's paper, partly thanks to advances in uh, smart contract work. And so um, we really did start out life saying, hey, there's this whole region of the landscape over here that's not getting paid attention to and deserves to be paid some attention. Uh, and, and, uh, and we think that that was really the right strategy. I think that was the right strategy um, because it turned out to be a pretty 
pretty fruitful area in a way that allowed for a lot of organizations to get involved and experiment with blockchain technology without uh, taking upon some of the burdens of the public blockchain space, the proof of work um, side and the, and, the, and the way that a, a financial instrument is at the heart of making everything run on those networks. Um, and that created a safe zone for them to say, can we just use it for that convergence on a single source of truth where we're amongst a set of organizations who are willing to let each other be known, even if that circle expands to tens of thousands of participants, you know, this is still uh, a different set of assumptions going in than the assumptions going into to building the public blockchain. Um, but I think everybody in that space acknowledged not just the, the, the debt that was owed to the folks working, you know, like Satoshi and others, but also that that, that landscape was uh, on the public blockchain side was continuing to evolve. And, and that frankly, it, you know, it was, it's a little bit different than the, you know, the VPN uh, versus public internet kind of debate. Um, but, I, I, but in truth, you know, every permission blockchain, you want the same thing as liquidity. You want, uh, you know, you want eventually everybody who has an appropriate role to play in that, that use case in that industry to be able to participate in that blockchain for, for efficiency, for reach, for economic value. And so we always felt that there was a lot to learn from both sides. And in fact, the first uh, business trip I took uh, to uh, was uh, to China to attend the second Ethereum DevCon uh, and meet Vitalik and all those and, and even send a message back in 2016. Let's figure out how at one point to work together and really paint this as a spectrum of options and a lot of different points on that landscape. Uh, and that really did come to bear first with uh, Hyperledger Burrow, which is the first Ethereum smart contract implementation uh, that, that came in, uh, designed for permission networks, but still you know, kind of learning more about how that community worked. Uh, and then this past year uh, in 2019, actually with Hyperledger Bezu entering as uh, a top level project as a peer to Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, and, and Bezu is a public Ethereum blockchain stack. You know, it does implement proof of work. It does touch that electric third rail, um, but it does so also in a way that allows it to be used for permissioned ledgers and have that full spectrum of, of offering. And so I think it's gonna be a key part of convergence in this in this picture. We're already seeing projects like the, the baseline protocol uh, and others that are really playing with that connection between those two. Um, and I think the public blockchains as a checkpoint for um, the integrity of permissioned blockchains is, is a really big deal uh, and will help us get to that trust and confidence, even on these blockchain networks that have just a handful of participants on that, where that degree of trustlessness might be threatened. Um, uh, the permission blockchains will still have an advantage from a transactions cost and a, um, a regulatory uh, kind of point of view. And we're not going to see the central bank digital currencies built on top of uh, permissionless blockchain networks just for all sorts of reasons. But, but I think the world is bringing these, these, uh, these sides together and hopefully leading us away from a dichotomy to something more of a spectrum. Okay, um, we also have a question here from Pamela Poole, which I think um, is, is interesting for this, the, the fact that it, like, it talks to, I think, all these other uh, you know, automated uh, technologies emerging, AI being a classic one, machine learning and so forth. You know, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, we are, there's a convergence between the development of blockchain technology and the fourth industrial revolution, right? The IoTs, uh, uh, structures, 5G, all of this stuff coming together at this moment. Um, I, I'm just gonna open this up to, to all of you. Um, you know, how important and what role does a blockchain play in that bigger, broader uh, economic you know, future? Because clearly we have, uh, you know, data is the, is, is, the, is the commodity, if you like, the fuel of that fourth industrial revolution. Um, and rights to that data and control over that data and the management of that data are going to be critical if we if we don't want just you know the, the entire IoT world to be run by say Amazon Web Services right uh, so so ultimately um, how does it how does this all come together how and, and and what's the sequencing look like in terms of blockchain's role in in that fourth industrial revolution I'll I'll just open up to the to the floor here or I'll give one example, Michael, if that helps at all. Um, I think each industry um, is probably on a different adoption evolution path. Um, for example, in energy, we're seeing a lot of the big energy players uh, in, they have meters everywhere. Um, and the meters are being used to actually, uh, sorry, blockchains being used to validate the information coming from different meters from different plants around the world so that the person who's actually in charge of monitoring doesn't actually have to go physically to each plant necessarily on a rote schedule and, and make sure and inspect that it's all correct or valid. 
um, because the validation has already happened if it's baked in. And so these experiments are now happening. I think it's a very interesting usage of the fact that there's already an IoT device. Now it's being made more, uh, well, the information is being validated on an automated basis so that within their own network of plants, which are all over the world, for example, they can actually aggregate that data real time and then analyze, analyze that data to the point where they're predicting when parts run down mm. or when they need to actually order things in advance so that they can preempt things breaking down and they have those parts available. So that's more of an internal large corporation example, but that's a big deal for these guys. And, and that seems to speak a little bit to what Pamela was asking about her question about like, you know, what role for human beings in all this, right? Does, is this, are we, are we witnessing a process that is going to make, you know, traditional jobs less relevant? And, and what are the humans going to be doing in all this? Again, anyone want to take that one? Actually, the WEF just put out a paper, which I thought was really interesting that, that describes the idea that Right now, for example, in blockchain, we, we, we couldn't possibly plan for every single and program for every single contingency. So we're still going to need, and, and certainly the philosophy at Accenture is that there's a, there's a powerful combination between the human and the machine. Um, uh, in that technology and innovation require both, right? That this is what technology is really doing is un unleashing the innovation that, that kind of exists up here. Um, with all of the the faculties that you know are kind of intangibles and how we actually bring this to the fore. So I think the the idea that we could actually program into a smart contract every every single variable, every single contingency, every single failure that might take place in the future is is probably just out of reach at this point in time and maybe forever. Um, so the the fact that a human needs to be involved, I think is is pretty is pretty solid. Well, we're we're, we're going to see shift, and and I think you know this is this has happened over the course of time with introduction of new efficiencies or technologies. You know, when when you think about how the, the this work from home um, environment really opened up people's eyes to what could what, what you know the fact that we could work from home and we could maintain a semblance of, of business processes you know if we worked in service industries and certainly Accenture was already you know working virtually or working at, at, you know on client locations so this was this wasn't as disruptive as it might have been to another organization but the the notion that we won't ever come together again and collaborate I think is pretty pretty far-fetched because if you can't if, if there is a role that that allows you to do to solely be virtual and never have to interact with somebody then I think that's when you're looking at is this something that can be automated is it something that could be outsourced um, is it something that you know we could you know just move to a cheaper location um, to do the same tasks so I think we're going to learn as we go but I, I think that the notion that that this disrupts um, this disrupts completely versus opens up new opportunities. I think is, is we're not we're not at, at, at that point in time. Uh, Emiliano, maybe the perspective of a, of a postal service would be interesting here because clearly the automation of of of, of mail has become something that's that's critical, um, and and traditionally it's an industry that's had a lot of human beings working in it. Where where do you see the intersection of say you know IoT and um, you know blockchain feeding into not just your industry, but how it touches other industries uh, in particular? Yeah, well, what I think is that, uh, uh, is that people are still so important in, in, the, in, in all processes and they, they just probably in the future will change their role and their work will be more simple because they, they 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 will be helped by by technology, but they are still probably the main component. At least in my organization, I see these things. People are, are, are the let me say the engine that moved the 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 organization, not the technology. Okay, uh, regarding the 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 convergence between different technologies, what I see is that uh, uh, blockchain enable the 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 concept of common knowledge uh, enable transparency uh, so there are a there are a lot of different projects that uh, as sandra said before uh, collect information from iot sensor and make the this information available to different stakeholders that are in some way interesting in in, in data uh, so blockchain uh, could be 
an let me say like like an integration layer, an integration layer and uh, and uh, a source of transparency uh, that that make uh, uh, that enable a, a different way to do business. I want, okay, great. Thanks, Emiliano. Like, I think I would, we've got five minutes left here. I think I'd like to sort of maybe dig a little deeper into something that we began talking about when Elisa was giving us this framework around, you know, the, the future of collaboration. And, and that is this, this concept that like, you know, and, and you mentioned it before, Elisa, I, it, when, we, when human beings do come together and collaborate, that's kind of when innovation happens. Um, and, uh, and yet, I, you know, I, I feel like the organizational structures that we've been built particularly, you know, the corporate structures have in some respects worked against that. And now we have this blockchain technology, which potentially gives us the chance to do that. So what does the future of innovation look like within the context of this kind of cross organizational structure? Do we, you know, and, and does the capacity to collaborate itself become, you know, the, the defining driver of what, um, you know, innovation means. Brian, you've been in the open source world for a long time where innovation is always thought of as a kind of this, this you know, hive mind idea. Talk us through what you see the future for, of innovation in this context. Yeah, and I, it, I think that in the early days of open source software, it was presumed that it was not going to be an innovative force, that it was going to be just more of a consolidating force at the tail end of technology movements, um, because I, presumably innovators needed the kinds of rewards available from <clears throat> proprietary IP licensing in order to uh, afford to be able to, to write the code in the first place. And uh, I, without taking anything away from that as, a, as an approach, that simply wasn't uh, uh, the rule, right? Uh, that certainly was one one way to monetize your idea, but also getting your idea out there and deployed so that you can achieve another thing on top so that you can disrupt a market so that you can, um, you know, take out a competitor perhaps, but also so that you can create some new opportunities for yourself is, uh, is a, a way that most of the world has figured out how to monetize open source software. The challenge with uh, for, for blockchain networks is um, you know, it does kind of go against the traditional Silicon Valley venture capital investment kind of mode of, I want to find the next Airbnb, I want to find the next uh, uh, centralized platform that everybody needs to go through and, and which can charge rent based on the value received rather than a more utilitarian kind of what's the cost of connecting uh, everybody. Uh, and that just doesn't work with blockchain networks, right? To fund those, to, to do the R&D, to get those to work, you do have to kind of ask companies to envision a world. And this is very much like open source where where there's a set of things you have to do that are table stakes for your industry and a set of things separate from that that uh, are your actual unique source of unique uh, of, of, of proprietary value, right? And that latter builds upon the former, but the former needs investment and work. And the more that you can cooperate uh, and, and fan out uh, the, those costs and distribute those across everybody who benefits, the cheaper that is for everybody and the more that everybody can spend to get ahead and build and go and tackle new things. <clears throat> That's a subtle message. That's one that requires conveners like the Linux Foundation and others sometimes to pull those conversations together and go, what are the pieces that really we don't have to compete on, right? That we can share globally. Uh, and uh, and those are delicate conversations. But, uh, you know, 20 years now into this open source as a commercial thing kind of direction, I think we've figured out how to do that repeatedly. Now we need to figure out how to do that in regulatory reporting in the insurance industry or tracing of pharmaceuticals in the supply chain or uh, uh, providing digital identities to, to in all sorts of use cases. And there's a lot of minds to change about how to do that. Uh, and a lot of re, uh, new, new ways people need to think about how, to, how investment turns into value in those, uh, on those fronts. But um, that, that's happening. And it's really encouraging to see. Uh, look, I think we're probably getting pretty close on, on running out of time right now. Um, I, I think maybe it's probably best to, to wrap it up. I was going to throw a quick last question on that. Do anyone, if anyone wants to have a quick final word, maybe uh, Sandra, you want to just give us a, a farewell thought on, on, on this, this bigger idea of, of innovation and, and collaboration. Yeah. Oh, well, first of all, thank you. Innovation happens at every level. Um, I'll give you one quick example. WEF and Hyperledger came together to map out the standards of where we are. Technical, legal, regulatory, Accenture supported us. Um, we need corporates supporting financially. We need the stakeholders around the world working together. We had academia. We are going to see more of this. We need more of this at every level, whether it's technical, legal, regulatory, governance. Um, and 2021, it keeps going. And it actually, I think we build back better. And for those who don't or aren't sure how to participate, 
reach out to one of the organizations and just get stuck in somewhere. You can eventually evolve and you know adopt uh, adapt to other areas, but get involved. This is a global community effort. Um, and look, let's face it, this cast alone is pretty awesome people. I enjoy the people I work with globally and uh, it's a good crew. So, you know, it's a good group of people to work with. And lots right. of opportunity here. Yes. All right. well, on that very positive note, we're going to say goodbye. Thank you so much, everybody. And for, for everybody for listening in from all over the world, uh, great to have you along for this ride. Thank you, Emiliano. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Elisa. Um, you know, here's to five, 10, 50, however many more years of hyping <laughs> like this. So uh, thanks for, for having me involved in this, everybody, and appreciate the, the great conversation. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Great job. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Elisa, Sandra, and Emiliano. Thanks. Bye. Hyperledger. Bye. Bye.